another uh Welcome back again to another Sunday School lesson as we continue to utilize the Gospel Project curriculum. You know, we're about in the middle of the life of Christ. And, and in this week, he's going to call us out a little bit. He's going to tell us that to follow him requires more than, than, than just showing up at church. Right? In this session, we come to see that discipleship, following Jesus, requires a commitment that has been carefully weighed and considered. One that reaches into every inch of our lives and radically transforms us. See, Jesus requires obedience even when it isn't trendy. He requires obedience even when it costs something. The cost for some of his listeners would be much higher than losing some social capital or, or cool points. Their commitment to, to him could cause a loss of livelihood, family connections, and for some, even their lives. If they were invested in following Jesus for the wrong reasons, and their half-baked motives would be revealed the moment they saw their beloved rabbi hanging on a cross. See, it's really easy to judge Jesus' disciples for their shaky commitment to him. But how often have you and I wavered in our commitment, even when our lives are not at stake? See, this requirement for total commitment, it's not easy. It, 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 but it is what we've been called to. And Jesus stands ready and able to help us answer that call each and every day day. So in Luke chapter 5, right, Jesus illustrates to those who wish to follow him that a verbal claim of his lordship in their lives is simply not enough. Rather than collecting as many followers as possible to build his Instagram empire, Jesus is actually concerned with the real heart-deep commitment of his listeners, commitment that leads to true transformation. Each and every time someone came to Jesus and pledged to follow him, Jesus tested their commitment by communicating to them exactly what they were signing up for. They would be living a nomadic lifestyle on their way to Jerusalem. They would have to miss important events in the lives of their families and communities because of their responsibilities to Christ. They would have to look forward without ever turning back. See, Jesus was not in the business of sugarcoating the disciples' commitment. He wanted to be abundantly clear. Following him would be the hardest thing they would ever have done. It would make them face fears they never imagined. It would take them into places they never envisioned. And it would ask of them things that they never thought they'd have to give. He wanted to make sure that those who were clinging to him weren't in it just for the cool miracles or the abundance of loaves and fishes. Jesus wanted to remind them that following him wasn't just something that they could say. It included things that they must do. See, our verbal commitment to follow Jesus must lead us to action. Here in, in, in Luke 9, there were three men who claimed to want to follow Jesus, but they all had their hangups. Jesus saw that one man needed to hear about how following him might lead to not even having a place to lay his head. Jesus told another that a, obedience to his call needed to be immediate, even at the expense of the man bearing his father. He told the third person that following him meant no turning back, not even to say goodbye to his loved ones. See, in order to follow Jesus, these three men had to put him above all else. Comfort, wealth, and family. The people mentioned in this account didn't choose following Jesus and earthly comfort. Following Jesus and earthly wealth or following Jesus and family, it, it was Jesus or everything else. This was not a casual commitment, but a life-altering one. And they needed to be clear on the terms before signing on the dotted line. If they want to follow Jesus, we have to be clear that following Jesus means putting him above all else in our life. We have to prioritize. We have to put him first. Prioritizing him rightly is the first step to actually understanding what it is that we have signed up for as Christians. And along the way, Jesus spelled out the cost of discipleship to these three would-be disciples who expressed their desire to follow him. He warned the first that, contrary to what many might think, Jesus' way of life was rough. He endured rejection and homelessness. And so would his followers. To the second, Jesus said there's no other duty. Even waiting to bury a deceased father, it, you know, it's an important and, and urgent commitment. But even more so is the desire and the commitment to follow Jesus and preach the kingdom of God. And to the third, Jesus replied that once a person has decided to follow Jesus, there can be no turning back from his service. In all three cases, Jesus' response spoke of absolute commitment to him. And Christians today are still called to follow him with single-minded devotion. See, discipleship is a process that takes place both formally and informally to affect our spiritual maturity as people follow Jesus. Informal discipleship, as, 
as passages like Deuteronomy 6 suggest, it happens everywhere in every arena of life. Growing in our faith and, and deepening our walk with Christ is something that requires our whole life, not just the mind. A formal discipleship kind of refers to periods of instruction. You know, you come to church, you come to youth group, you know, we make disciples through our words and actions, providing verbal instruction of God's word and nonverbal examples through our own lives. And so it should be apparent to us then that Jesus used hyperbole in the passage to drive home an important point. Our allegiance to him is so complete that it should even surpass our allegiance to our earthly parents. We should strive to love and respect our earthly relations to the best of our abilities. Yet our love and respect for Jesus should far outweigh our love toward any other that this respect in turns looks like hatred on comparison. And this is radical, right? This is a crazy notion for us to think about and get our heads wrapped around. But this is exactly the point that Jesus is making. Our love for him should look radical to the world around us. In Luke 14, Jesus paints an illustration. A man is set out to build a tower while calculating how much the project would actually cost. After the foundation was laid, he ran out of funds and was completely embarrassed by onlookers who had been watching the project from the start. In the same way, Jesus is telling his listeners that following him isn't something we should wake up one sunny day and decide to do without first stopping and counting the cost. It isn't something that we can do half-heartedly. Just like building the foundation of a huge tower, it isn't something we can just abandon halfway through. To take up our cross and follow Jesus is a lifelong endeavor with eternal significance. And so what does it actually look like to give Jesus our total commitment? You know, every culture has some notion of a senseless war somewhere in its history. Jesus took this notion and used it to describe the kind of king who avoids unnecessary bloodshed and inevitable defeat by using his common sense to reason his way through another solution. Following Jesus is not a ploy for earthly renown, because to truly follow Jesus is to deny personal glory for ourselves for the eternal glorification of God. See, Jesus reminds his listeners that his disciples were expected to be salt and light. And we've talked about this. Right? Our job is to spread the message of the gospel to the dying world, not to, to become like the world. Our battle is not glorious to those with earthly eyes. Nevertheless, our calculated effort to follow Jesus reflects the glory of our Father in heaven. We are by nature preservers of self. Right? However, Jesus' words in this passage fly in the face of self-protection. He has already told us that our love for him must surpass our love for other people. And, and as we've already discussed, that feels like a radical departure from other biblical commandments. Now he appears to be departing from the assumption buried deep within his other commandments that we should care for ourselves. Instead of reiterating the call towards self-preservation, Jesus teaches the opposite. We should take up our crosses. When we follow him, prepare to follow him all the way to the cross. We should love our neighbors. We should love ourselves. And we should love Jesus so much that our love of ourselves looks like hatred in comparison. We should come to Christ as if we have already died because our lives belong completely to him. Jesus was not here on earth collecting followers just for numbers sake. He was interested in having followers who knew exactly what they were signing up for. He still is doing that. See, counting the cost of discipleship is an important step in making a commitment to Christ. Half-hearted commitment is not a mark of Jesus' people, nor is it kind of a wishy-washy understanding. Following Jesus doesn't just cost us a lot. It will cost us everything. It, Jesus himself is our example in laying down his life for God's glory. He came to earth and lived completely, undeserving of the death that awaited him. But yet he still laid down that life for our sake. He died a gruesome death so that we might know a reward that we did not deserve. It is this reward that makes the cost of discipleship infinitely worth it. Jesus reminds us that he is completely deserving of the sacrifice that he is requiring of us and that he will return to us 100 fold. At the end of the day, Jesus' concern wasn't about amassing lukewarm followers for show. Instead of getting followers with the promise of earthly benefits, he pressed them to walk away unless they were truly willing to count the cost before coming to him. 
See, he is abundantly clear about the cost. There are no hidden fees, but the decision to embrace whatever cost to follow Jesus starts with the heart. Are our hearts willing to let go of the things of this world and give God our all? Are our hearts so captivated by the glory of God that they are willing to deny being captivated by all the world has to offer? Discipleship involves a personal commitment to follow Jesus, but that commitment must begin with a heart that truly loves and desires him above all else. Jesus warned his followers that following him is not just some passive decision, but an active assessment of everything we're willing to give up for him. The cost of following him is incalculable because following him will cost us our entire lives. If we are not willing to part with the things most precious to us and put Jesus in the top spot of our lives, then we need not apply to become his disciples. If we come to the table trying to hedge and negotiate, trying to give just a little less than our all, then we do not belong at the table at all. Because Jesus sacrificed his life on our behalf to provide our salvation, we seek to commit our time our resources, and energy for the work of sharing Christ with others so they too might be saved. And I think so many of us kind of come to this point and and come to this decision to follow Jesus without really thinking about what it is that we are committing our lives to. See, we're not committing our lives to showing up to church on Sundays, to to come to some random building. That's not what Christianity is about at all. It's about what we do each and every moment in our lives? Are we actually putting Jesus first? Do we actually care about what Jesus thinks about in our lives? If you were to really examine what it is that you do, how it is that you live each and every day, and then compare that to Jesus, what does it look like for you? I think for so many of us, it wouldn't even compare. And so the question is, are you ready to to truly make a commitment to follow after Jesus? See, there's reward in it, but the reward is kind of far off. We don't always see the rewards in our lives right now. But the question is, what do you want to do with your life? Do you really want to follow after Jesus or not? Because showing up, like I said, on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night isn't enough. Those things are good, and we need to be a part of the body of Christ. But if that's all that Christianity is to you, then you're missing the point completely. And so if that's where you are and you want to know more about what this looks like to to actually follow after Jesus, let's have a conversation. Let's continue that conversation. Let's, Let's build into that. I would love to talk with you more about that. 